Welcome to PartialArc.com. <laughs> Don't do that. In the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. And a lot of weird shit. Roll to seize! Welcome to Roll to Seas. This is episode 55. I'm your host, Jay Jones, and I'm joined by my co host and Warhammer enthusiast, Andrew Dickinger. That's me. I'm a person. You are a person, and we are two people who are temporarily without a, uh, a place to stay uh, here in the Black Library. I mean, uh, a real place to stay. We're in some kind of cosmic void closet? Yeah, cosmic void closet. It's a. Uh, it's fine. You know, it's not as spacious as the endless, it's, endless rows that were the Brown cramped. Library. It's very cramped. Yeah. Uh, if people don't uh, know, uh, you might have heard this at the end of our last recording, but uh, the Brown Library, after years and years of two great, uh, you know, what would I call this, custodians or, um, you know. That might be asking a little too much. Yeah. Uh, protectors. Caretakers. Caretakers of the uh, yes. the ancient Brown Library, the secret mm-hmm. subsection of the Black Library. Now, some people do believe that not only was it the secret subsection of the Black Library, but the longest running uh, poop joke in all of Warhammer history. You know, I think it's debatable. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure we had prime real estate. We did. And quality stuff in I mean, there. I know that the Brown Library was the most important secret subsection. Now, the Harlequins did let us stay in there mostly for free, and they didn't seem too bummed about the destruction, so maybe it wasn't as important as we were giving it a lot of credit, but they, I think it was very important. They also allowed us unrestricted access, which was probably, like, a sign. Yeah. Not a good sign. No, not a good sign. <laughs> uh, but anyways, it turns out that part of the library uh, has... Uh, since the last recording, fallen into disarray, and a lot of things are loose in that area now, and it's been cordoned off. Uh, disarray is a very loose way to describe <laughs> sucked into the void. Yeah, we, uh, we're not allowed to go anywhere near that area again, so they've given us this closet temporarily. But don't worry, we're going to find a more permanent location, hopefully by next month. Now we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, kind of things that have arisen uh, recently while we... Uh, plot our next move real estate option here in the Black Library. Yeah, because I did manage to rescue the Vox device, which is litera- literally our only connection to the outside world. At the yeah, point. otherwise we would just be sitting here in this closet, and then I mean, who knows what we'd do? Just, y- I guess, stare into, the, did you into check- that void on the wall? Did you check the door? It was locked for me. I mean, well, hold on, let me check it right now. Okay, that's weird. Um, so we're locked in here. Yeah. Uh, so you- they trapped us in here, is what you're saying. <laughs> So maybe after we destroyed, maybe not their favorite subsection, but a subsection of a very, 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 very powerful and potent uh, library, they uh, decided to entrust us with this closet. So good. Or trap us. Maybe this is our new prison. I think we can find our way out of here. Um, But while we plot our now escape instead of temporary um, relocation, um, maybe let's talk about some of the new news that's come out. Yeah, I mean, there's been a smattering of things, but no Gene Stone Cold Codex yet. Not yet. Now, at this point of this recording, and maybe by the time you're listening to this, um, it is on its way. So it is coming the pre-order is on its way by the end of uh this week when we recorded this but uh some new rules have leaked about the gene stealer cult some say the last codex uh but i guess sisters of battle is truly the last codex yeah of the first run of the first run of the first run now of course we're probably going to get as we've predicted with our magical crystal ball that is always correct uh we're probably very definitely going to be getting if not like a miniature model release probably a black legion codex in a month beginning of march i mean i'm honestly thinking that the first lead off after sisters is going to be a brand new chaos space marine and brand new uh adeptus astartes well codex. i don't think we're gonna get a sisters codex until deep deep into 2019 i'm saying i think a month from now that whole like oh. the harkin world eater bear or whatever like daddy abaddon's coming in 30 days 32 days i think that's not only a call out at least to potentially a new Abaddon model, oh, which people please. have been asking for forever because it is old. Get rid of the freaking weird stalk head mohawk thing. <laughs> yep. 
please. Oh, he's going to keep that mohawk, and it's going to get taller. Make it stylish. It's going to be a stylish mohawk. He looks ridiculous. I mean, check out the hair that Magnus is rocking. I mean, he's got some pretty good hair. Well, well he's got luscious locks going on. I See, mean, like that's what the Imperium is missing. Like the hair game in Chaos Space Marines is real strong. No, but here, here, let, let's be clear here, though. I mean, Magnus has one clear rival, and that is Lilith Hesperax. Have you mm. seen that that main? She's got I some mean, serious hair going on there. I mean, it's even got spikes and barbs in it and shit. I mean, mm, taking it. She's she's got a lot of accessories Beautiful going on there and deadly. So I mean, here's hoping that the number one thing we're looking for from an Abaddon hair. model is good hair I and mean, maybe some cool rules and good posing. You know, everybody. You know what? I'm sure everybody wants the what is it? The Typhus model pose that everybody was super jazzed oh, about. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think people were more ex- more mad about the forest friends that came with him than uh, anything else. What? Come on. He I doesn't was, want to have forest friends. No, I mean, like, I, I admit that I did have some disappointment with that model because kind of his thing is that he's hosted... He's basically a man made of bees, mm. and they didn't lean into that hard enough, and I expected you just to see him and just scream bees. Yeah, I mean, he should have had some jars of honey on him, right? I mean, like... Get get a, like a little side business going on, like get like a little farmers market action happening. Who would there. buy that honey? <laughs> I mean, I I would try it. I mean, you try it, right? No, no, no. You probably wouldn't. It's coming out of a hollow man made of bees. <laughs> Maybe at least smell it, right? I'm, you got to be curious. No, what's going on in there? It's a Nurgle thing. I mean, how many antioxidants are we talking about? The reverse of antioxidants, maybe? Like a negative. Like, suddenly yeah. your your organs don't work anymore. Guaranteed, the assassinorum would get their hands on that honey and be like, yes, perfect. Armar, <laughs> what are those guys? The guys that explode when they go into close combat? What an Eversur assassin! Yeah, arm yeah. the Eversurs with honey. But then what, what? It's it's chaos made. They wouldn't use that. You're just going crazy, town. Yeah, we've gone down a rabbit hole here. We are, talked about typhus. We're talking about bees. Back to talking about <laughs> new stuff. New stuff. Potentially some stuff with Black Legion, but that's that's coming. But yeah. what we guaranteed we know is definitely coming is a crap ton of Gene Steeler cult new characters. I mean, they, they've gotten a, basically a brand new model run. I mean, with the Tooth and Claw set that came out, they got new aberrants. Mm-hmm. They got an aberrant character called um, the Abominant. Yes. And then and he's walking around with a big old stop sign. Uh, he, yeah, he, well, it's a, yeah, he's got some kind of street sign going on. It's amazing. Then not only in addition to that, with the Gene Steeler cult reveal, I mean, we've gotten new bikes, which look amazing. They look so cool. A four-wheeler, then a, like... It, I, I want to say it, it looks like a Halo Warthog. Yeah, kind of. It kind of looks like a Halo it looks, Warthog. It looks real. If everybody doesn't remember, Halo was a game from thousands of years ago. Yes. I believe we have the data slate for that old game a while ago. Uh, yeah, Combat uh, Evolved. Combat Evolved. They had no idea what was coming. Yeah, they had no The combat <laughs> definitely evolved for sure, though. They were predicting something. Uh, but uh, th- that... That vehicle actually looks really cool, in my opinion. The design is pretty neat. Yeah, it's like a, it's like almost like a futuristic 40k combat Humvee, which is just, it just looks like a cool vehicle. The car game has been strong lately in the model department. They um, have just been like, we're getting buggies in there for orcs, we're getting bikes, and apparently a Halo vehicle in there for Gene Steeler Colt. But then in addition to that, and like uh, you know, they got it like I said, a four wheeler as well. But then they're getting a smattering of new characters. Oh so. my god, a mil- like a new. I believe it's a new Magus, right? Or is that a new we Primus? Haven't, uh, it's a, okay. So w- there is a new Magus. Uh, it's a, very clearly, it's a female Magus, but we don't know yet if she's a special character right. or not. Right. She might have a name. She I, might not. I kind of hope she is, because that'd be kind of cool. That would be really neat. Um, And I hope she has the same tier in a treatment of she's not for a specific type, mm-hmm. but maybe she would be. I don't know. Because that's the thing. Gene Steeler Cult, they've rumored, are going to have like maybe four, maybe six like chapter tactics yes. type abilities, which is amazing. Near, I didn't even... Near I confirmed. completely forgot about that. Near so. near confirmed. And one of the more, more powerful ones, sort of like silent more powerful ones I've heard of, is uh, Real World Ones for Combat. Combat, which normally they can get with cold, cold icons, but that would essentially save 20 points per unit to mm. not have to get an icon. Also, it would mean that pure string gene stealers can get reroll ones to hit even without the, the uh, big old daddy nearby. Yikes. Uh, that's so some rumored good. stuff there, and I'm sure by the time you guys have heard this, there'll probably be some more stuff that's revealed from the the Warhammer community, the Great Workshops Vox Network that they uh, they sprinkle out there. But as of this recording, we've only really heard a little bit more about the overarching rules as well as a few more of these characters. We got to talk about the one character that you and I are the most excited about. Okay, so there is the character that that he's like like a chirurgeon for for uh, aberrants. He like gives them boosts, but then my 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 daddy. The one that I wanted to be the best, and he is. He could. He has Andrew's maybe favorite character in the entire 40k line right now. Uh, that is by, by far and away my favorite model in the game. It's very cool. You probably know what we're talking about. 
The, it is the guy who's looking at a digital screen, right? It's the guy who's looking at the no, map? No. No? He's not your favorite of all time? No. The three-armed fucking gunslinger. Hells yeah. It, it's literally Clint Eastwood gunslinger, except he's infected by an alien virus. I mean, he's so awesome. He's so cool. And his rules are so far uh, beyond what I could ever imagine so them being. So dumb. Why? Is, he has every rule. He has so many rules. But like When he, they revealed that, it just kept going. I was like, and this? Why? But he is literally the best gunslinger. I mean, his rules are kind of on the verge of bonkers. I think Cypher is a little jealous. jealous. Beyond jealous, man, especially since he can't be taken in, like, an army anymore because he <laughs> his only factions are Chaos and Imperium, which means you can only take him, like, by himself or with Fallen. That's it. Hooray! Man, I mean, the, the two-shot, three two-shot pistols that if the... If just if he hits, and he hits on two pluses, he gets additional shots, so... 12 sh- possible shots. So normally it's six shots. Normally six it's shots. It's two shots per gun, and he's got three of them. 12, he's got three arms to rock those three guns. So 12 possible shots, and then with the new ambush rules, he can get a free shooting face, so possibly a 24-shot gunslinger. And that's if everything goes right, but still, who cares? Because they're strength four, which is good. Minus one. Minus one. Great. Two damage. Auto two damage. Why two damage? And then we uh, also, he can pick out characters. And he can pick out characters. What the f- he's what a the hell is going on there? Because, Jay, I don't play the game, but it's high noon. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, I, I could not have. I saw the rules, and I was like, he, and then somebody was saying on one of the leak, for, uh, the leak uh, areas that we looked at that he's sub 100 points. He's like 80 points. And oh I was just God. like, holy God. Ooh, baby. He better be a special character. I'm taking three. As a <laughs> as a Eldar player, that is a terrifying unit to be out there what? because my little warlocks and farseers are just going to get gunned down Wait, so you don't, fast. You don't want him to come in with an ambush and... Free shoot and kill one of your farseers, and then normal shooting kill your other farseer. No, no, I don't want that at all, but dude. He's good. <laughs> he can just shoot anything. I mean, with two damage guns at minus one AP, like I know it's only strength four, but he can start capping like dude. smaller vehicles and take them out pretty reliably. Dude, somebody made the comparison that he's essentially a ranged uh, solitaire, and it's oh. totally true. He is, yeah. He's essentially a ranged solitaire. He's got to be. Oh boy, he's got to be a named character. I hope he's a if named he's character. He's not. Oh, you're gonna see. I'm him. taking three. <laughs> three of them in every damn list. Um, oh jeez. I mean, just to have the model, I would take three. But I mean, I'll always take one. But like, man, oh man, Whew. was he through the roof? And uh, and as for the army in general, they've revealed at this point, like not a at this point, we haven't seen too many other specific rules about like factions and or sorry, chapter tactics. Solid and things. confirmations. But uh, what we have gotten is how the new cold ambush is going to work which is pretty neat how now you can choose between two different things where either you can drop in nine inches away from the enemy by coming from the underground which is typical deep strike which then they 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 then have a stratagem going along with it called they came from below yes (laughs) with three cp which i think is fair for what it does because it either lets something come up then move d6 and then it can just do its regular turn which hey guess what you got your 20 pure strain gene stealer you know or, supercharge or in my opinion 15 guys with rock sauce yep <laughs> one of those things <laughs> or you have the other option where they can do this thing called the actual new version of cult ambush where you're setting up like tokens which are really interesting yeah it's essentially uh yeah we won't go too de- into depth into it but it's no more like a just you roll a dice and then you get a result and it does a thing the impred- impredictability of that but then- which i actually like because now you don't have cult ambush like this like i know you get previously some abilities where you could roll three dice and you could re-roll them but like yeah. there's still some rng there i like that it's like and now you have stratagems to guarantee those more like amazing double shoots or amazing you know easy charges yeah well i think it's more interesting for me even though it has more resource management because it's a new token system and, but it has this like built-in faint thing so it essentially rewards the better general mm-hmm. essentially for knowing the army better and knowing how to fake people out with those things and even though there are some tokens that are fakes and some that are real you also have stratagems that a- allow you to add more fakes or then replace a token with a fake so you can do some little tricky yeah, shit going tricky on stuff. so like I'm pretty psyched about Gene Stealer Colts. I we've been hearing rumor that they are going to be the new orcs, the new Imperial Knights. They're going to be a meta changer. They're going to be a meta changer. They are going to change how you play in tournaments and what you bring because holy crap, I hear they're just crazy powerful. But thankfully, with one new good change to a certain army or a certain set of armies that has tr- problems, uh, a new rule came out, a beta rule called 
bolter uh, drill for anything that's Adeptus Astartes, which includes Chaos Space Marines and regular Space Marines. Which is pretty cool. We should talk about that briefly because it's by, you know, coming up fairly soon, bolter drill will be in full beta rule effect. Now, Andrew and I are going to a large Warhammer 40k event, which we're going to talk about for the majority yeah. of this episode. The Las Vegas Open. The yes. Las Vegas Open um, that happens the week of, I think it's uh, it goes from like February 8th through the 10th, I um, think. Basically eight days from the release of this episode yeah. is when it will happen. Around that, yeah. So it's that's when it's going to kick off. But uh, in the meantime, uh, Bolter Drill, I believe the beta is just in effect right now. It's just not in effect for what for Andrew that large and I are... Yeah. are basically practicing for yeah but you can use it i think right away so let's talk about it um so yeah so bolter drill essentially is a modified version of bolters that's just for space marines so like other things taking uh bolters will still be able to use bolters and still be able to use the rules for them but space marines essentially get like a slight enhancement when they use them because they're space marines and they're better with them so essentially for normal any normal infantry i'll get into the special stuff later any normal infantry means that uh, the only real change for them is that if they're stationary, they can fire two shots up to their maximum range as opposed to one. Which is nice. If you're camping an objective in like backfield, you can actually get some good firepower. Well, especially out. for things like intercessors that have the 30-inch uh, minus one shot. Now they can have two shots instead of one. It's Which literally doubled their output. That's pretty great. good. And 30 inches is great. But then the real, real change to boost to a lot of things that needed the help. Um, vehicles, terminators, and bikes now fire rapid fire always. It's amazing to max what that means is max range always so like terminators uh with their four shot storm bolters are four shots at 24 inches and now you don't have to when you deep strike them in put them in i mean they're terminators so hopefully they're not in the danger zone when they're close to something maybe they want to be there to charge it but like if not you can give them some good distance when you drop them in or if you're just moving them up the battlefield and they can still put out their full payload well per your comment though the real advantage of it is that it gives them engagement distance beyond the front line right so if they kill that first thing then they can actually since they're typically slow moving can still engage other things but i'm saying even when they drop even if they're dropping at the nine inch mark typically that 12 inch rain isn't going to get past the front line yeah it's true you're right if they have like a screen and they're just blocking out those now you can shoot beyond the screen Mm. with all four shots which is like that's it's very good and then for bikes it gives bikes a welcome change to be able to just at any speed fire four shots up to 24 inches and then of course like vehicles it always made sense that they should just fire their full shots always because they're vehicles yeah um, but like even it for helps stuff- Ravenwing a lot, like those yes. bike armies that I would love to see more Ravenwing armies come back. Uh, white scars, or white scars. Um, it helps uh, space wolves. Uh, I mean, like the one t- for me though. The I mean, Death Watch Terminator suddenly got a <laughs> huge boost. Yeah, Death Watch Terminator is like a little bitch. Uh, I mean, like uh, yeah, I will happily accept uh twenty four inch range four shot poisons. <laughs> Yes, please. Poisons on twos. On two, two plus poisons. Uh, yeah, I'll take that every day, all day. Now, and uh, we like this rule a lot. I think it's given a lot of boosts where it was needed for Space Marines. But it's not too far. But it's not too far. The, no, the we all, we all had that moment. I know you had that moment. I had that moment. Was like, oh, where no. we first read this and everybody, half of the universe read that and was like, oh, yeah, eight shots per storm bolter? What <laughs> the why? Why would you do this? Yes. Terminator's coming in with like 80 shots at 12 inches. Or and it was like... This is no why would you do this? I just thought about it with Death Watch, and I was just like, I can't be beaten. Like, yeah, it was like, just like I it's too win much. automatically when um, I drop in a unit. Four shot intercessors. Oh, Holy boy. God. Thank God. I was so happy that that ended up not being that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, and although there are some there are some salty dogs out there that the custodies did not get access to it. You already have twelve shot yeah. weapons. Shut and, your mouth. And, and I get some of the, the, the arguments about things about custodies should be better, but it's like, it's not so powerful that it's outweighs custodies. I mean, custodies are incredible. Everything they do, they're two up, they yeah, and I mean, saves, they're If amazing. their infantry have guardian spears, they their their bolters are strength four, AP minus one, auto two damage. So yeah. like, get out of here. It, it's fine. It's fine. Um, they're amazing. That's pretty much it. And that's pretty much it. But like, there's some cool stuff going forward. Oh yeah. But now let's talk about our favorite segment, Andrew, our seasons of the month. It's where Andrew and I talk about, uh, games that we played in a previous tournament in the month where we might've made a few mistakes and could potentially learn from said mistakes. Andrew, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, mine's kind of a big one. So, uh, yeah, I'll go first. <laughs> okay. Take it away. So I have uh, a, a, what I call a stigma. Jay a, con- a condition? Jay calls it a condition. It's called the master of indecision. 
And what this means is that it's your special warlord trait. It's my special warlord trait. Well, you, I mean, you 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 alternate, right? You pick different warlord traits depending. Like sometimes you have the I roll terrible warlord trait. Most Mine is of the time. I can't choose. Yes, but this one, you for most default times when you're out playing a game, it's this. Um, so I have a problem committing to armies because I love this game so much and I love to play different and try different things. And I have a tendency to rabbit hole into an idea and convince myself so hard that it works and to never try it. And I've two years in a row gone into LVO with untested armies. Oh my God. Let's, let's talk about the, the, the highlights. Wait, uh, no, three years in a row. Is it all three years? It's three years in a row. My goodness. Okay. (laughs) Let's call out the favorites. Number one for me has got to be, Jay, guess what? I brought an all-Tau vehicle army last minute. For a seventh edition. For a seventh edition. <laughs> it was all just a bunch of devil fishes and a bunch of uh, hammerheads. Yes. Yes. How did that army do? Um. Well, I still went four and two. Okay, it's not bad. It went. Uh, it was not bad, mostly because of the shock factor of people not knowing how to deal with yep. 13 plus vehicles in seventh edition. Um, but so that then, one was pretty fun. But then I went against 7th edition Magnus and one game, and Magnus killed my entire army by himself. What was your uh, What was your last year's last minute change? Uh, it was go- jumping the Tyranids out of nowhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, so then, like, I had, like, playtested a little bit of Tyranids, and then I jumped back to Tau, and then I was like, hey, I'm not doing Tau, and I went back to Tyranids at it's, the last second. It's the classic move. So, Andrew, what did you pick last minute an army that you've never played and decided, you know, what, this is going to be my army. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I need to, I need to, you know, preface this a bit. Fair that enough. like I had known what I was going to play for all of November and December. You are my witness. Mm-hmm. I was playing it. And then January rolled around and I got an idea and thought that I was going to be able to learn, build, paint and play a brand new orc army by the time LVO came around Yep, and had started to do so. And then we had recently a test game tournament and I just re- had an existential moment of just being like, there's no way I can have this ready in time because I have literally like 10 days to finish the whole army. So then I but did... But even, not even just finish it, but also just be comfortable with its play with style. It. Yes. So then like I made the, the, the correct choice, which was the default back to my death watch for LVO, which I know uh, I would say a good 85% of what I'm taking. There's only a few X factors, which we can talk later on in the show. But like the army is almost entirely painted, so I don't have to think about that. And I also had been playing with it for a while previous to this. So like I at least know its capabilities and I'm not going in literally like, hey, I played this army twice. I hope I do well. Woohoo! <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my problem. <laughs> And that's uh, that I, I, I pretty much wraps up my season of the month, which is, you know, like when you're going to the biggest tournament in the country, you should probably commit a couple months early and practice. Yeah. And get it ready. Yeah. And not be rushing the How week before. How did those games with your Orc Army go? Um, well, they were tests. <laughs> let's let's also lead with that. They were tests. They were test games. They don't count. They were test games. Um. Which in in and of itself is the it outlines the problem of that I'm still testing uh ten days before the major tournament. Nice, not a good choice. Right? Yeah, I mean they didn't go great. The second game was very clearly like I need to see what this can do because I've never used it before. The first game I got my butt kicked by ironically the same army that also beat you i think yeah yeah i mean a surprise army that was well very well generaled and just like man i just don't know works at all and i'm also not comfortable with like 100 models i haven't played over 60 models in like five years (laughs) even people are like but you play tyranids i don't play horde tyranids i play elite and monster tyranids i don't play lots of models i just can't do it my brain just doesn't work to that capacity and playing so many models can be so taxing especially if anybody um who's gone to like full grand tournaments or even just playing like two-day rtt's even just maybe just a regular rtt three games like it is taxing to go three games in a day moving like 150 models on well, the table. And plus these days you're on you're literally on the clock. Yeah. And for people who don't uh, who don't play in ITC, which Andrew and I do and we'll be playing at the Las Vegas Open, which we'll be talking about in our I guess not Brown Library segment or uh, our Void Closet segment. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about our list for the Las Vegas Open. Yes. But uh, in ITC, when we play, we use chess clocks, basically, yes. because this kind of removes this 
problem that's existed and whether it's been intentional or non-intentional it's called slow play occasionally you have people who play slowly right and most of the time it's always never intentional to like screw over another player but sometimes when someone takes way too long especially with an army like 150 models or more like you can rob some players of turns and chess clocks change that and what that does for armies like that is you've got to be super tight you got to be super fast to move that many models around the table quickly. ah yes because we should describe uh that with the chess clock system if you run out out of time you literally can't do anything with you your can army only roll for saves saves nothing else you can't even you, if you're charged in combat you cannot swing back nope because that takes you can't count use as stratagems to like make it harder to hit you or things like that nope. you can't do anything your army just stands there becomes and gets vegetables punched. and gets punched like it's super key to manage your time well in the lvo which format. is why horde armies are not only taxing just mentally and physically having to move all those miles around but also it can just really put you into a lot lot of stressful moments with that clock yes so like for me it was just the app decision to real uh, to have even though it was it took me up until 10 days before the tournament to realize it was a bad idea but once again i rabbit hole really 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 hard my but, still my favorite rabbit hole to this day though is crisis suits <laughs> i i mean yeah that was a bad one <laughs> And I, I mean, I still don't. I don't think anything beats the all the all vehicle tower army though. That was a pretty good one. I should point out that the Jay, Jay, you know, he emphasized it pretty well. That was three days before LVO. And you just that painted I put it all together. of them super fast, and you were like, "This is the best thing." It was like Andrew. three days. <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough that last year when I brought Tyranids at the last second, I was painting some of them at the tournament the day before. That's how bad oh, I remember. my crisis I remember being is. in the room and you were still painting them before you went down. My goodness. I have problems. That's one of them. But, but, your list is locked now, it's hopefully. It's locked. Um, and it has a lot of tools that I want to use, and I love Death Watch, and I use them very well. And I think, you know, because I did pretty well at the big tournament that happens in our neck of the woods. So, like, I think I have a good chance. And, like, at least I'll be comfortable with the army. That's very important. So, uh, do we want to skip right on over to the next segment? Uh, Jay's the seizes. What? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> so my season of the month is, as Andrew indicated, we've had like a lot of recent tournaments. We had kind of like the main tournament, which my, my list actually did decently well. At. I, ca I came in second in that tournament. It's the LVO prep tournament in our area in Pasadena. Um, but uh, most recently, this just this previous weekend, we did this kind of test tournament, which was great. We got a bunch of people who are going to LVO together in one place to just kind of set up terrain and games similar to what we might think will be at LVO and kind of just slam our lists against one another and see kind of where our lists are are weaker where we need to tweak and, and how to prepare for some of the tougher armies out and, there and and to talk out the turns essentially yeah. realizing though there's no gr grudging here there's no like counterplay like make ourselves better as a group and essentially be like well we should i probably should have done this yeah i think you could have done this like essentially like make ourselves better as generals yeah and i basically i had a, I had a good first game we we ended up only playing two games at that and we talked out a couple other play with other armies but we had some great players there testing out games and my second game of the day, um, I played against a Dark Angel, Blood Angels army. Yes. And I've been very excited to play against this army because it is almost a perfect counter in a lot of ways to my army. So many shots. It's, it's so many shots and mortal wounds, which mortal, is what we'll talk oh. about is. So uh, this guy's an incredible player. He's He's been honing and, and tightening up this list for a while. He's, Danny, I, shout out. He's such a great guy to play against as well. Um, and he's a great general. So I knew I was in for a really tough game. And just, we're going to talk about these lists a little bit more in depth when we get into our, our closet segment. Um, but uh, basically, I was running um, a new version of my clown council. It's back! I was very sad that the clown was gone, but it's now back in the list. Uh, basically, from a high level, it's still my seer council, the 10 uh, warlock conclave on skyrunners on bikes, um, with the farseer on a bike, three wave serpents now to protect a whole slew of uh, guys inside, and some harlequins to back them up. Yeah. Basically little characters. Focused on the seer council, and then maybe a smattering of solitaire in there. Smattering of solitaire. <laughs> but uh, basically, my, my big C's comes from me overextending my army too early. Basically, how uh, my opponent's army functions is he's got three Dark Talons, which if you don't know, they're the 
Dark Angels planes that are just incredible. Space Marine Flyer, they're fantastic. They can hover. They have 24 bolter shots. Um, they all, I think, actually, are they heavy bolters? No, they, no, they're, they're they have, hurricane they, bolters. They have two hurricane bolters. They have two yes. hurricane bolters, so it's 24 shots. They have and a, they, the rift cannon in front. They've got a rift cannon, which does like... It does like a lot of damage first off. I think it's strength ten, and then if it wounds something, auto, it then, auto three damage. Yeah. It then can also do if on a three plus do mortal wounds after the fact. Oh, it's like it's like a baby demolisher cannon because it's only D three shots. But the the added caveat with that extra mortal wounds, which you just mentioned, is that unlike most guns, which is like it's on a single model, if it's if it's taken damage, then it takes wounds. This is if it's wounded a unit at all. Mm-hmm. Then you get to do on a three plus D three additional mortal wounds. So this thing can engage like difficult to like shift units like big scary units it can also engage tons of infantry with all of its shots yes but it has one extra thing that really 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 concerned me well at least it's not bombs and which is a hard counter to my list is and you just teed up it's their bombs they each have a what is called a stasis bomb so yes. all three of the flyers have a single stasis bomb now they can only use this once a game thank the emperor but this thing is nasty particularly nasty for my list how it works is as long as the flyer has flown over a unit, you yep. can drop a stasis bomb and do this once a game. And he rolls a die for as many models there are in a unit. I think up to ten. Up I think to it 10. caps to ten. Up to ten. Um, and when he and he rolls those dice on a four plus, he does a mortal wound. Yep. Well, this is key against me because my seer council, my warlock conclave, is ten guys. So when a thing flies over it, he just rolls ten dice, and statistically, he's going to get five mortal wounds. That almost kills two of my bikes straight away, and he has three of these things. Yep. So if he flies over my Seer Council three times, he could almost, he'll kill more than 50% of the unit. And if you just cut out 50% of my unit just straight away, I am in a very bad, I'm on the back foot hard from the top of the game. Also, they have a 40-inch movement, which means you just need to be within 38 inches. Exactly. And he just goes boop, boop. Yeah. <laughs> And he can hover them, so I tried to pull out some tricks in this game to not get bombed. I forgot that they could hover, because I... Basically, let's talk about my Cs. So, I we do our little roll-off. Um, I have deployed all of my stuff in the very back right-hand corner, so that if he goes first, he can't really go over my Seer Council, because the he'll, he would have to go off the board, because I'm in the very back edge, so he can't actually go over them. And I've positioned my Wave Serpents around that he can't even like kind of crisscross fly over them. So it was a good setup, but basically, I won the roll-off to go first, and I was like, I gotta kill those planes, I gotta kill at least one to like minimize the mortal wound damage, so I freaked out. I used the 2 CP to Phantasm to move my Seer Council up and one of my Wave Serpents. I, uh, I spent 1 CP to move my Solitaire up to kill some of his characters, and my plan did work. I turn one, just threw my Seer Council up there. I quickened them to get them super close up to the Flyers, basically right up against with Quicken, got them right up next to one of them. And my Solitaire flew up and, and punched a, a Smash Captain and killed him, which was great. Um, he ended up dying afterwards, but that, that was part of the plan. <laughs> um, but I got up there and shot a plane and killed that plane and wrapped it and killed it in close combat, and there were two planes left. Now, problems I didn't anticipate. One... Completely forgot about all the minuses they get, and I failed some key powers, so I didn't have guide. I also didn't get fortune off, which is very important because that means I don't get my five plus ignore wounds. I typically say five plus feel no pain. That's not a rule in the game now in eighth edition. It's something we we typically refer to that a layover from seven. A layover from seven, but it's typically what you see on disgustingly resilient on Nurgle, where if you take a wound, you roll a die and on five plus. It's the only it. way that he can get saves against mortal wounds, mortal wounds, which is key against the bombers. I didn't get that power off, nor did I get guide, so I wasn't wounding the plane very easily and i was just about to take a serious beating i managed to kill one and then this is where my seize comes in because instead of just letting him go first he would have to fly his planes up he would be away from his minus one to hit which is if you don't know the dark angels little skimmer or i guess it's considered a type of land speeder it's a type of land speeder yeah that uh, the dark shroud the dark shroud gives everything within six inches of minus one to hit which is incredible and they're flyers so then they'd have another minus one yeah so they were minus two to hit i started to get the feeling of what it's like to shoot eldar planes which is hey. annoying hey um now you know yeah now i know it's, it's very frustrating <laughs> um but basically i could barely kill one in close combat but then by overextending my army my seer council was just hanging out there, missing some key powers, one of them being fortune, one of the other ones being conceal, which means it's a minus one to shoot them. So they were in a very dangerous position. But without the fortune, without that five plus ignore wounds, 
I thought I was okay because I was behind his planes thanks to my charging and everything, but I forgot they could drop into hover mode, and both of them flew over my seer council in the next turn. Man, you just conveniently like brought your army to him. Yep. <laughs> and he bombed the crap out of them, shot at everything at them, charged them with everything, including Mephiston, and including his two character guys, the Talon Master and I think Samael. Yes. And they just go in and they wreck in close combat. So they're, my seer council is pretty durable. It's meant to take a full brunt of an army shooting at him, but with missing key powers and mispositioning and not really thinking about everything that was about to happen thanks to those bombs, they were basically down to four guys out of ten, which is basically like crippling my army. So I played the rest of the game basically on my back foot. We had a really good game, though. It was really fun. It was it was down to the kind of that final turn to see where we landed points-wise. He ended up swinging it because he's an incredible general, um, but... Man, I made a huge mistake by just not letting him go first because with my positioning, he wouldn't have been able to bomb them. The planes would have been out and I would have had the full brunt of my army to take down maybe one, potentially even two planes. And then just getting a bomb from one plane is bad, but it's not that bad. And I could have potentially had my powers back up. Yeah. So I mean, you would have at least been a, a, even though you wouldn't have had your powers on turn one, you would have been able to brunt more of his shooting than the, the instant mortal wounds that he's getting. And now we've said this a bunch of times that you can't blame bad dice for a seize. We never like to call that out for our seizes. No. And I said I didn't get some key powers off. Now it sounds like I'm complaining about bad dice rolls, but no, it comes down to bad positioning. Because you know why I didn't get those two key powers off? It's called Psychic like Hood. Because of a psychic could from a guy named Mephiston. And I didn't have to be within the range of his psychic could to get his plus one to deny, but I mispositioned. And that plus one to deny fortune and conceal, he got exactly one more every single time. <laughs> And denied my psychic powers, my two key ones, because of that. So it wasn't because of bad dice. It was because of bad play on my part. So always check. Check the deny the witch I range. Mean, check the psychic hood range. I mean, psychic hood is only 12 inches, so you yeah, were right close. I was real too close. <laughs> so uh, that was my season of the month. Um, now we go into our new segment, a temporary segment, the uh, closet. In dark closet. Dark closet in the library. <laughs> All right, here we are in the... Andrew, what is this again? Well, I mean, a dark closet is kind of... It's very grim and dark, that's sure. Yeah, but it's, I, it's a little depressing, though. I, I feel like we should upgrade it a bit just to make ourselves okay. feel better. Yeah, I like it. How about Mysterious Wardrobe? Ooh, the Mysterious Wardrobe. Now, there are no clothes in here, at least that I can see, but I still think that's a little bit nicer. We're wearing clothes. <gasps> yeah, that makes sense. We fulfill the requirements. All right, so we are in the Mysterious Wardrobe. Definitely not locked in it. Uh, we'll definitely find our way out of here. Uh, but in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about... LVO, as it's called, or the Las Vegas Open 2019, and kind of our prep. Yeah, so essentially, uh, anytime you go to a major tournament and there's like a big enough competitive scene that you see enough variety, especially with something that's literally this large, the largest in the country, you're going to see a lot of different things. But you got to really prep to build your list to fight five things in particular. Yeah, and we're going to kind of call out what we think those big five nasty factions or army types are going to be at the Las Vegas Open. And uh, if you don't know, the Las Vegas Open this year is massive. It's a big tournament that's going to have... Now, I think there's 800 registered players, which is easily the largest tournament ever, well, I think, just, in just the world. Well, just for the champions. Just for the championships, the 40K championships, not including narrative or friendly. Or but, the uh, other games I think there. they'll probably have like maybe 700, maybe 720 people actually show up. There's usually some attrition. But that's still far and away the biggest tournament, I think 40K tournament, ever yeah what period. if it goes the opposite length and then they have to fit more space <laughs> i don't know if it'll go that direction because i think they've cut i think they've cut it off at 800 but still it's it's going to be the largest tournament that's 40k tournament yeah. ever so, so much warhammer in one place so there's there's so much to plan for and uh when we're building out our list which we're going to talk about in depth as andrew mentioned we got to think about those top five so do you want to kind of kick off who do you think is your first of the top five the fist that you must prepare to get punched in the face. Okay, so, I mean, of, of, of army types, typically what we say is that you need to uh, be able to face one thing very well, two things reasonably well, and then the other two things you can handle, but it's not necessarily your best matchup. Right, you just pray to the emperor that you won't play that army, right? So, and it always works. <laughs> He answers all your prayers. Sure, sure. <laughs> so the, the five versions of army that you need to fight is knights, 
because knights is a thing, baby. Super heavies, lots of them. That's a thing you're going to have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Uh, elite armies, something like custodies, where there's lots of super toughs, or there's not lots, I should say. There's more than you'd think there would be of things that are very tough and have lot. They basically fulfill every requirement. They shoot lots, they combat lots, lots of bad stuff. Maybe something like a seer council. I mean, like maybe that's. I don't know what that is. Um, the next army you want to face is uh, MSU. So multiple small units is what that means. And that's essentially an army that goes for the mission more than actual kills. They're looking to cover the board and essentially grab more objectives than you every turn. The fourth type of version is Horde. Yep. I mean, you're going to face armies that have so many fucking models that there's no way you could possibly kill them all. I know it's Jay's personal mission that if he sees an army, <laughs> he has to kill everything in it as fast as possible. Of course. I mean, that may have been related to a seize or not. I don't know. But like, <laughs> we're just going to let that go. So the fifth one is kind of like a wild card. Previously, it would be something like dealing with like a demon star and lots of psychic powers and stuff like that. But ironically, the thing that you're just going to probably have a high, almost a 50% chance probability to run into in game just with how the odds net out is a Castellan. I yeah. mean, you're gonna almost every Imperial army you will face will have a Castellan. And it's not the now I know we mentioned knights as number one, but that's a different kind of list. It's a different can of worms. Like the knights is gonna be three or four knights in a list. And, and then lots of little things. And lots of little things. Probably like the the loyal 32 as they call, which if you don't know what that means, that means the uh, three units of 10 guardsmen with two, uh, I, I believe they're just uh, company commanders. Company commanders to just give you the five CP and CP regen. Yep. And then or they, I think now they're calling it, I think it's like the rusty 17 which is the the 555 five, five, uh, i think rangers or uh, yeah the ranger or rangers in adeptus mechanicus yeah. and then the two uh the the imperial guard tech priests that are only like 25 points now yeah so they can also give you the 5 cb but either way it's it's a backup um with the the four three knights and those knights are going to be probably a warden who's got a lot of good shots maybe castellan probably one or two gallants because yeah. gallants are incredible but you have to make sure you deal with that now the castellan's different because it's probably just going to be by itself but supported by a bunch of nasty stuff yeah i mean the the army is very but the typical castellan army that you're going to run into is a combination of a castellan and horde and then one elite unit so like the most common army that you'd face is a crap ton of catechins yep. just lots of infantry that all Eight, join probably together. 80 of them yeah and then one big bulgrin unit that's basically the counter to any combat unit you might face yeah this can take the form of bulgrin or maybe custodies that are allied in yeah or again it's just it's your beat up unit. They'll have one beat up unit, and then it, th those are all screening a Castellan in the back who's just getting all the stratagems and is just so hard to kill unless yeah. you really commit to it and has some of the nastiest anti-elite and tank firepower in the game. Oh, currently. my God. And it's still so powerful. This is what people were calling for a while, if, if you've heard this on other uh, Vox recordings, a.k.a. podcasts out there, um, The List, which was so dominant for a long time and arguably still very, very dominant and has a very real chance to probably win the Las Vegas Open. Absolutely still a contender. But so then those are essentially the five things that you're going to plan to see most often. And like we said, you plan to kick the crap out of one, beat up two pretty good and then at least have an answer for the other two um so we talked about the you know the castellan army that you're gonna face whatever smattering it is the, yes. a castellan surrounded by things um we talked about knights which is typically either three or five knights or three knights and a bunch of little knights but then always having you know probably a loyal 32 or a rusty 17 whatever yep. they call it backup um just to give them cp because knights are very cp dependent um, but then the, the three others that we mentioned were MSU, multiple small units, elite armies, and horde. So, I mean, horde's pretty clear. You're going to face basically two types of horde, maybe three. Well, you can sort of count the Imperial Guard as being a horde army, but it's not like fully committal to horde. Yeah, I think they're still closer to that Castellan mix because yeah. I, I think that's what you're seeing. Of, of Again, this is you'll see every type of list in the world at Las Vegas Open. I mean, someone could just have like a billion dreadnoughts or like, you know, a bunch of, I don't what? know, a bunch of hammerheads and devilfish. Well, people don't use armies with five dreadnoughts. That's yeah, not yeah, that's not going to happen. But, uh, but what we're talking about is like the key things to keep a lookout for. Um, probably you're going to see with Horde, you're either going to see orcs or you're going to see chaos. Um, I, I actually, I disagree. I think that because of the increase in cost to the, uh, to, uh, for chaos to the cultists, I think that that is just 
in a weird way, just turned off a lot of Chaos players to that strategy. Now, I know you're referring to the cultists, but I think you might also still see Zangor bombs or yeah, Bloodletter bombs. I mean, we have still yet to see somebody run 80 Bloodletters. Like, that's a thing that's going to happen at some point. But, um, which I hope it doesn't, I hope I don't have to fight that, but it, somebody will eventually get the memo and be like, oh, I could just run like 120 Bloodletters. And it's just like, yeah. Can you run them up to units of 40? I thought you can only go up to 30 with them. No, you can go up to uh, 30 with them, but I mean, people take them in units of 20, but they're a troop. But you can only do three of them. They're a troop. Oh my gosh, you're right. It's a troop unit, Jay. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's so many. Anyways, <laughs> don't so, listen to us. Uh, so yeah, that's a chaos so yeah. horde you could face. But more than orcs, likely, the orcs is going to be the scary Or one. Tyranids. Yeah. I mean, Tyranids is another horde army that you could face. You could just run into, you know, a crap ton of gene stealers or just 120 gaunts because they're all fearless and good luck getting through all of that. Yeah, so you got to be prepared to kill a ton of bodies. Now, we talked about that. So let's talk a little bit about MSU. So that's potentially either going to be your Eldar, which is- Eldar is typically MSU. Typically MSU, or- or you're going to see Tau, I think, potentially in that top tier. Now, this is... Now, we disagree a little bit on this, but I yeah. think a really strong, tight Tau player could get into the top eight at okay. LBO. Okay, so I think the potential is there. I think another MSU army, which is the MSU army of Space Marines, like what we faced, mm-hmm. um, that's definitely an MSU army you'll run into. With Tau... Okay, I am a Tau player, or a former Tau player. I've kind of given them up for a while. I need a break. I think Tau is basically a lot, very much in the way that they were at the end of 5th edition, which is essentially it's an absolutely unforgiving army. Oh, yeah. Where if you don't play it super tight, it falls apart very fast. So you're you're kind of thinking like if you're on day two in your sixth game or even in the top eight and you're at the and you're starting your games out like it's yeah. going to be hard to play tight for that many games yeah i think it that that is uh is because it's so unforgiving it becomes down to the caliber of general and i'm not saying there aren't good tau generals out there i'm just saying to play at that level the whole time mm. it, and assuming you don't go against a counter army against you the whole time is like that's a lot of risk yeah, it's true. Well, I, I feel like we might get one in the top eight. I would be super happy if Tower in the top eight. That would be great. I mean, it's sad that there's not a lot of variants being played in that army right now, but I think that they, they per your point, they absolutely have the potential to be there. Yes. And when we say, and by the way, we say there's not a lot of variants or what's going to take to get in the top eight, we know there's tons of ways that you can build an army, but we want to clarify, we mean what we think is going to be the most hyper, hyper competitive. Remember, when we say top eight, so yeah, that's literally 1% of the players that are going to be at LVO. Yeah, so I mean, like the Tau army that you're just going to see in the top level is is probably going to be uh, two to three Riptides, maybe a unit of broadsides, a lot of firewares, and a lot of drones. Like, you're just not going to see a lot of variants in that yeah. because there's a lot in the Codex that still needs help to get to that competitive Someone's going to come in with those secret sauce piranhas. I mean, 15 piranhas is still a it's thing. It's a lot of shots. Like, it's that could do work. But, but that's what we're expecting maybe from Tau, but maybe we should talk a little bit about Eldar. I mean, I think you're still going to see... Inari. Inari is going to yeah. still be a thing. I think we're going to see one Yanari player in the top eight. I think there's a real chance that it'll mm. it'll it'll squeak in there. There's some still solid Yanari players. A lot of Yanari players previously have actually switched to some different factions, but I think we'll still see one slip in there. My my the only reason I would I would counter that Ooh. is because unlike a lot of these other factions that I think we'll see jump in because they're being played more, I think the reason we won't see Yanari is because of their mari- marination length. They've been around long enough now. So you feel like people, people are getting bored. That I think that people have countered them for a long enough time now in the meta that everybody's just going to be like, yeah, I, this is how I deal with Yanari. I think, I think it's a mix of, I think Yanari is still strong enough that like, I mean, they were still winning and they've been around since LVO of last year. So I think, I think the curve is a, a combination of that. People will be prepared for some Yanari stuff. They know Shining Spears, kill those things. Um, but also I think there is potentially like, some people have moved on from playing Yanari because yeah. they've been doing it for so long. I mean, it's just like what, the thing, though, that's funny with regards to what I mean by my statement with regards to, uh, you know, the it, the marination length is that essentially there's always a degree of shock factor because there are still a lot of rules in 40K. And if a codex comes out yeah, fairly recently, Yanari definitely won't have the same to learn. surprise that the Dark Reapers no. had at LVO last year where everybody was like, they can do what? That many times? Yeah, so essentially because people have had essentially the preparation time for that type of army, which mm-hmm. has been top tier for so long, I think I think that Yanari players are essentially going to have more of a minefield at this event where you're going to have 
hard counter Yonari lists. And if our top tier Yonari players just go against someone who happens to take a rock to their scissors because they don't like Yonari, then, I mean, that, you, there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah. And that can happen. Um, but as I, I think the elephant in the room with regards to uh, elite armies, I think we can just say it right now because we've gone over MSU. Because we've done MSU. I mean, elite armies, it's it's custodies. Yeah. I mean, that's the elephant in the room is that the elite army that you have to watch out for at LVO is freaking custodies. And they are, we've been talking about wow. this a lot lately. Custodies, I think, are so, so strong. They were strong all throughout 2018, and they've kind of like kept under the radar a little bit. But they have really creeped up to being, I think, a very strong contender. I think they aren't as a solo codex. I think when you smatter in mm -hmm. the Rusty or the Loyal and give them the, that extra CP boost and that extra home field holding boost, then they suddenly go up to an 11. Yeah. And those Custody bikes are just, wow, are they strong. Yeah, and I don't think like it's like it's like a, like a they're going to win everything, right? I think some of the stuff with Custodes is dependent on like who goes first just because they're they're very range-dependent, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, a Custodes player is, sw is sweating bullets if he goes against an army that has a lot of auto-2 damage. I mean, it's just and, like, and a, and a lot of range and makes a Custodes player go second. Like, terrain, they're very terrain-dependent. They're very, like, first-turn-dependent, I think, uh, depending on the army they go up against. But, yeah, if they get the right turn to go first or they got some good terrain to hide like they can ooh, they can really mess up well, some they're, armies. they're what we call an avalanche or a waterfall army that as soon as like it's like for waterfall it's like as soon as you're over the edge or for an avalanche as soon as that ball starts rolling it's an army that gets out of hand very quickly yeah. and it's just like if they allow to get that ball rolling it's just like there's no real recovery at that nope. point it's just run so needless <laughs> to say i think we've kind of almost named every single faction in, in warmer 40k but i think that's a smattering of the if you look at those five different things like what you have to feel like you can really take out like andrew said like two things you feel good about and then two things you can maybe play the mission or play the objectives to overcome uh one msu army that we did not mention though and i think we should and i think it's because it's another like caliber of player like necrons we of course <laughs> I'm, by the way, shame on you. I'm not knocking on Necrons. I'm going to be playing them in 2019. I'm yeah. very excited. I'm just obviously they're they they could be in a better place. They're hard. They're hard to play. They're yeah. a hard army. But I think the MSU army that is uh, I've I want to see them do well because they have the potential to. But I have not seen it yet. Is Drukari mm -hmm. and I think Drukari and it's not just because of Vect. Yes, Vect is very strong and good. But that army has a lot of tools that a lot of armies aren't ready for. And I think I think they could have a really good showing in LVO. I mean, like, Drukari, remember when they were just crushing for months and months and months? Yes. Then, like, Imperial Knights came, and they, they did really well. I think we're going to see... I mean, there's some really nasty lists out there with the homunculus covens. I mean, with Talos and, I mean grotesques are still incredible i mean even the secret sauce of witches being able to just make an arm a unit not able to leave combat mm -hmm. not even having to wrap just to being like here's a strat or here's a, a war gear item i have you have to beat me on a d3 hey guess what i get a d6 uh, all right i guess that's not gonna happen we're stuck here like that's such that's so strong in so many ways and can lock up so like even key things, key things that require combat, but they're like single models, mm -hmm. and they just can't kill ten witches because they have four plus invo saves. Like man, I think there could be some Drukari armies out there that really just like surprise the hell out of yeah. people. Yeah. Now for our, now that we've talked about like a ton of the factions, what do we think are going to do well? Let's each of us make what do we think our top table prediction is? What two factions do you think is going to be at the top table of Las Vegas Open? Oh man, I've got mine. I can go first. Uh, you can go first. Cause... Okay. I think for one, it's going to be the fifth one we talk about. It's going to be the Castellan and a bunch of stuff. Yeah. I think it's going to be Imperial Guard backed up with a Castellan with a nice smattering of I'm going to hit you in the face, whether that's a mix of a little bit of Custodes or more likely Bulgren. And like, again, like a bunch of Wyverns doing anti-infantry. Like, I think that's the one side of the table you're going to see. The other side of the table, I'm hesitant because we've got... Some really good players playing orcs, which that Luda bomb and some of the tactics they can pull can be really nasty. I also think Custodes are maybe a sleeper move. I do think Tower are going to make it into the top eight. Fingers crossed. I do think Yanari are going to make it into the top eight. But I don't know with either the matchups that they're going up against or like we've talked about, like having to play really, really tight for that many games and the people who have switched from different factions, if they're going to make it to that top table, I'd love it if, I mean, I'd really love to see Tau at the top table. That'd be incredible. I think I've got to say Castellan versus, uh, I think I'm going to say Orcs. I think it's going to be Orcs yeah, and orcs. Castellan. Well, I think the, the, the reason that we mentioned Castellan, the Castellan uh, loyal combo, the loyal uh, soup combo is because 
the army is forgiving. That doesn't mean it's easy. Don't take, that as, don't take that as saying that we're saying that the army is easy to play. That's not what it means. It means it has a level of redundancy that is very comfortable. Yeah, it has a lot of it has a lot of tricks it can do, and if it loses like one unit, it's not completely there's, gone. There's so much overlapping with that that there's so many answers to so many things and, that there's no good way to face it. And to it. take it to the top table, you still gotta be a top general. Absolutely. There's no point click army in the game. No, no, right no. Now. No. And especially get to the top tables, absolutely no. not. So those are my top two. What are your top two? Okay, so um, I want to say lo the the loyal soup, uh, because of its forgiving nature and how essentially it can. Re it's good for a like a medium player, but how it rewards an amazing player oh, yeah. is like oh my god, and it has so many tools. Um, I I am gonna say I'm not gonna choose that because uh, we should choose two different. Oh ah, yes, being contrarian. Um, I'm going to say that uh, I don't, not orcs. I don't think orcs are going to make it because I think orcs have some hard counters and I think orcs is a snowball in the other direction where it can, essentially if you lose one or two key units, it can get out of hand mm. for yourself very quickly. I'm going to say I think custodies is going to be that, up there. That was actually a, a tight one for my pick as well because they... If they get some good matchups, they have some bad. They have some bad ones out there. They, but if they get some good matchups, they can really do some nasty. So stuff. I'd say, I'd say for you, the the loyal soup is your loyal soup against orcs is your choice, and then your wish list is Tau. I think that's how we can organize that. I think Custodes and Eldari honestly uh, could still make it to the top table, only because once again, Eldari it's a marinated yeah. force. It's proven to work. Yeah. It's got great tools, and it's, it's true. Vect combined with uh, doom, the Doom Seer, as everybody calls him, the little yeah. far seer that p pumps up, and then some Harlequin support. Yeah, double, and I mean, even a even a smattering of Yanari in there, double shooting Reapers is still a problem. Yeah, like that's still a thing you have to be able to deal with. Even even Shining Spears being able to fight twice and stuff is like, wow, that can really put a hurt on you. So Yanari and uh, Castellan, basically, uh, Yanari and Custodes is my two, mm -hmm. and then I think my uh, my wish list. I think this. Wait, wait. So which one do you? But who do you think is going to be at the top table? You think it's Custodius versus Yanari? Yeah. Okay. I think Custodius like and Yanari, and I and then I think uh, my wish list army, the one that could sleeper it up to the top because Ooh. they got some amazing changes, is Tyranids. Ooh. I think Tyranids has the capability now. Maybe not the generals, and me it, being one of them. It would be crazy to have one of the only index armies like gene stealer cult mixed with tyranids to have gene stealer dominant army with like maybe not dominant but some sprinkled in there make yeah. it to the top table would be amazing yeah i mean tyranids got uh, so many sleeper changes in in chapter proofed like massive point drops that dramatically changed how you could play that army and i think that the the the, the juice is there to get them there now if the players are like me probably not but if they're better than me, which is most everyone, then I think they have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think these are some good predictions. Now we're going to be totally thrown when it's just Grey Knights versus Necrons on the top table. Wow. To win it all, baby! Or, no, I mean, you you still, I think you didn't go deep enough. I think I think you, th even throwing Necrons in there, I think we should get some Agents of the Imperium love going Just Agents on. of Imperium up there? Just Inqu Inquisition. I like it. Against Necrons. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, so those are kind of our armies to prepare for and and what we predict to be in the top tables. Now let's talk about our list that we're taking. Do you want to kick things off? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I, as is mentioned in my C's, it's been a roundabout adventure. <laughs> um, discovering myself and having existential 40K crises of, not crisis suits, cri uh, uh, an existential crisis <laughs> of discovering what kind of player I want to be. And it turns out it settled on Death Watch. Yep. Um, so I, I love Death Watch. I think I love Death Watch because as some other, you know, players and stuff have mentioned us, Death Watch is essentially how I envision Space Marines should be. Like just in a, as a whole. Yeah. As being these super elite warriors with the, with these custom, this ammo for every occasion and these tactics to basically fight anything they go against. Like that's just how I envision 40k Space Marines of being these forces to be reckoned with that just go in and it's like a hundred guys and they totally mess up an invasion plan or something like that. Like, that's how I want to play Space Marines. So the Codex, those their stratagems, in my opinion, left something to be desired in more variability than actual what their effect is because they've got some very powerful stratagems. Especially in some Xenos armies, those those 
single stratagems against like Necron, single stratagem against orcs and stuff like can get pretty gross. Yeah, I think I more wanted some of their neutral ones to be a bit cooler because mm-hmm. I think they can struggle against certain non-Xenos armies and that like hurts them a bit. Um, like even just going against Chaos can really mess their dip because they just don't have a good answer against like psychic chaos and stuff like that yeah but i love them to death and i i you know having almost a fully painted army already that i've spent so much time into and i'm a big intercessor fan i love death watch intercessors not only the models but i mean having that native ap1 and the the 15 inch rapid fire is multi band and two wounds and two wounds oh god to have so much more durable to have a two wound space ring feels like be space rings because they should be two um, but yeah, so what am I taking? I, I should uh, get to the list. Okay. <laughs> so I'm taking one uh, Death Watch Battalion, one Death Watch Spearhead, and then uh, a Vanguard of uh, Officio Assassinorum. So like, I love Assassins, and I don't think they get used enough, and I'm sad the only way that they made them takeable was you either take one and get minus one CP, or you have to take three and then get no CP, which is just like... <laughs> Come on, GW. I mean, like, if you're investing in three already, why did they lose the CP? Yeah. But, yeah, so I'm taking, a, as I said, a Vanguard of them. Uh, so a full three, a full three assassins, a Spearhead a Death Watch, and a, a Battalion Death Watch. My Battalion Death Watch is two Watchmasters, one that's like a sub smash captain. I don't have a, a Storm Shield on him because I couldn't afford it. But they do have a native 4 plus invul save, so that's still pretty good. Still pretty good. Um, but to give him a hammer, just because the hammer is a very convenient weapon to have. Hitting on threes, re-rolling ones with a strength eight auto three damage hammer is very nice. Very nice. And you've got a great model for it, too. That model is awesome yeah, with the hammer. Yeah, I like my hammer model. <laughs> um, and then uh, my warlord is, if you're familiar with the old data slate, uh, uh, either in book form or anime form, Berserk. Oh, yes. Uh, my warlord is Guts, the main character from that. Now, wasn't that old data slate uh, known for having terrible animation, right? Depends on which one. We're going down a completely different yeah, let's, let's not let's not let's not branch out to that. We don't need to get into a, a berserk conversation. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, but yeah, I modeled my captain uh, who has a relic blade, which went down by, uh, significantly in points. It's only nine points now for a relic blade, which is great. That's awesome. I think it was twenty five points previously. What? Um, yeah. My God. Um, but yeah, if you don't know what a relic blade is, it's plus two strength, uh, AP minus three, uh, D three damage. So it's basically like a superpower sword, which is pretty cool. And uh, so he has that. He has uh, a Mastercrafted bolt gun, which is an auto two damage AP minus one bolt gun, which is great. Yeah. And with special issue ammo, can wound on twos, which is always fun. Uh, special issue ammo is. Oh, um, and I should mention my Smash Captain has a Storm Bolter, and uh, he has the option to then, if I want to spend the CP, get the Bane Bolts relic and then have a four shot two plus poison auto two damage. Stormbolter, pretty good which is always fun but yeah so the uh the guts character with the relic blade he's my warlord they both have jump packs obviously so one can deep strike him when you want to deep strike and the um, other one can jump through things and punch people in the face yeah they're probably both deep strike most of the time but like definitely i can leave the other guy at home because essentially like i want to be able to get the reroll cp from the the, the beginning turn and you can only do it if he's on the table so makes like, sense and the smash, he's usually the one that's going with the forward forces and in the face of things yeah. and probably going to want to jump in there. I mean, he wants to smash. And Yeah, I mean, that's his job. It's his job. And then so I have two full intercessor units that are nine intercessors with bolt rifles, a single auxiliary grenade launcher, and then um, uh, an inceptor with two uh, assault bolters to essentially give them fall back and still shoot, which is amazing. Yes. Again, two plus poison. Auto- automized one. So good. <laughs> Um, so two units of those, they'll almost always be deep striking. And then, uh, the last is a full unit of 10 intercessors with no inceptor because most often they are going to be combat squatting and holding home objectives, which makes sense. And they're very durable. Yes. Like home objective campers Uh, in cover. Yeah. They are hard to dislodge when they're in cover uh, surprisingly. And in units of five, they're basically immune to morale, which is just like, you have to kill all of them or you don't stop anything because they're obsec. Pretty good. So that's the battalion. Then my spearhead, brace yourselves. <laughs> this is where the special, the special Andrew secret sauce comes into play. It's, it's funny because I didn't realize it until after I made it. It's a full Forge World spearhead. Oh my goodness! Um, so it's my HQs are two Chaplain Venerable Dreadnoughts, <laughs> uh, both with double fists and double uh, storm bolters. So they're like my punchy Mick or as I as I call them because man the dreadnought model is so small 
comparatively to all the big stuff in the game now i call them my angry lunch boxes yeah <laughs> angry lunch box because <laughs> that's what they look I like you're gonna say trash cans no yes. no the trash cans is orcs yes these are square and boxy and it looks like you fit a nice lunch in a nice them. little lunch box so they're my angry lunch boxes <laughs> <laughs> um, so those are my HQs, um, and they actually can do, they have a lot of variability. They can guard home as a counter charge unit. They can go forward and punch things. They're actually really nasty in combat. I mean, they hit on twos, re-rolling ones always, because they're a nine wound vehicle, but they don't degrade. Mm -hmm. And they're characters, so they can't be targeted, because they're nine wounds. Pretty nice. They have four attacks. They're strength 14 in combat, because they're normally a strength six dreadnought, but their rule that I kind of hate means they're plus one strength. <laughs> So the strength 14, they're AP minus three, auto three damage. And they, I mean, they're wounding on twos against anything that's not a knight. And the, if you want to, you can wound on twos because they're death watch. So you give them plus one to wound. Not bad. And then they, of course, because they're death watch, they reroll ones to wound against your chosen choice. So hitting on twos, rerolling ones, wounding on twos, rerolling ones. Can't get more reliable than that. Pretty good. And then eight bolter shots each at half range, which is still pretty darn good. So two of those. And then uh, I have two Mortis Contemptor Dreadnoughts. Now, the Mortis classification means that they're a gunboat. So that's all the Mortis choices in the Forge world is it means it's replaced both of its Dreadnought combat weapons with two ranged weapons. So the Mortis Contemptors are 10 wounds. They have 5 plus built-in invul, which is so key. Um, 3 plus armor, normal stat line of a normal, normal Dreadnought, you know, strength 6, toughness 7. But the key on these guys is that uh, one of them has two twin last cannons, so four last cannon shots, and they're BS2 plus to start. Very nice. Super nice. And then the other is two twin auto cannons, so eight auto cannon shots at BS2 so plus. So many to start. auto cannons. And again, the secret sauce is that they're death watch. So they re they're re rolling ones to wound against things mm -hmm. or getting bonuses to wound against things. Very strong. Now, what is the last fifth thing in this detachment i mean it's not really anything it's just a leviathan dread not with two storm cannon rays <laughs> now if anyone thought that we have changed our ways of not just doubling tripling quadrupling down on units here's the proof right here we are still not one dreadnought five dreadnoughts five dreadnoughts so the Leviathan Dreadnought, if you don't know, is a brick shit house. It's sixteen wounds. It's T eight, and he does look like a brick shit house. He looks he like is a brick shit massive. house. Massive. Uh, yeah, he's sixteen wounds. T eight. Uh, built in four plus invul save. Great. Very nice. Two plus armor save. Awesome. And he, the storm cannon arrays are ten shots each. It's an auto cannon, so strength seven, AP, uh, auto two damage, but it's AP minus two. Which is very nice as compared to the minus one. And compared to the minus one, especially against things like custodians. And we've talked about it on this show before, like minus two is the sweet spot. Strength, strength five, AP minus two is like the best gun you could have. Like that's perfect against I mean, if it's everything. strength 16 minus two, also better, but still. <laughs> yeah, yes, Jay. That's the good benchmark. <laughs> but yeah, the fact that they have that minus two, and you alluded to it slightly, that against things like custodians. Where you're making them take their four up invul, it's very good. Yeah, anytime you're forcing them to take the four ups against custody bikes, and auto two damage against a four wound bike is like the perfect place to yeah. be. Yeah, and that thing is twenty shots because it's got two of those things. And he's natural BS two plus to start. So like, <sighs> I mean, nice. when he he will also be deep striking in most games. So that's my three deep strike because you can deep strike a dreadnought or a unit of infantry. Surprise! So, so yeah, there's two intercessor units, and the dread will be deep striking with a captain almost every game. And boy, when they come in, they come in hard and fast. Oh yeah. Um. So yeah. So that's that's. And he. I should also mention he also has two heavy flamers on him. You know, just in case. Of course. Um, Why so, not? Yeah. So that's 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 the dread detachment. And then my uh, my uh, assassinorum vanguard is a single Calexis to just give me some home field anti psyker because he's still an amazing anti psyker and objective holding unit. And then my favorite two Eversur assassins. Oh, baby. And they have one job and one job alone. And that's where are the boxes that have closed size that my dreads can't get into? Oh, those? That's where the Eversurs are going. Yeah, because at LVO, and, and this has been talked about in a bunch of different places, so we won't talk about it at length. There's a thing people call, quote unquote, magic boxes. Magic boxes. Or you can just refer to them as basically little buildings that you cannot see into it's an enclosed ruin you have to get inside of it there's no like hole on one side there's no hole in the ceiling or anything so you can shoot from on high you have to be inside of it to touch 
the gooey center that is usually like a mortar team or dark reapers. Yeah, I was um, going to say, let's talk about dark reapers. Yeah, the dark reapers that everybody wants to go punch that are inside those buildings. So essentially, the only way to get into those buildings if the enemy is more than one inches from the one inch from the wall, because remember, if they're within one inch of the wall, you can still charge, you can still charge them, them, which people forget sometimes. But you can't shoot them unless you can shoot out of line of sight, and you can't get into the building normally unless you're infantry. So unless you have indirect fire... And unless they put themselves up against the wall, which they probably won't, you need somebody to go in there and uh, do a little punchy punch, a little choppy chop. And uh, I mean, a, a little 70 point Eversur assassin, not one but two, just looks at them and it's just like tasty, hmm. tasty morsels. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, so they're essentially there to kill the the side field, the flank objective holders or the units that like Dark Reapers like to b- bounce in and out of those damn Yeah, and just buildings. one of those guys in your backfield. I know for me with my army, that would be terrifying to just have him back there. Just If he's just knocking out one troop unit on an objective like that's costing me points every single turn yeah i mean essentially if 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 he does his job which is to kill just one backfield objective unit and then be a a, like a wall for your units against that objective that's it he's done his job and he does it well what is it his 3d6 charge when he comes in right uh, no it's not when he comes in every every turn every time he charges he has a 3d6 charge very nice and when he charges he gets a bonus to attack so he's eight attacks on the charge a little mini solitaire yeah and he explodes (laughs) and he explodes oh yeah when you kill him uh, everything within three inches takes d3 mortal wounds on a four plus yeah so look out for those guys they're gonna be scary jumping in those boxes stabbing people kablooey so that's my army so essentially the 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 way that i've paired it off with the five things because we can you know i went over the army briefly so i think the armies that i handle the the army that i handle exceptionally well is uh msu i think i can because i have death watch with two plus poison msu armies don't bother me essentially Mm -hmm. like if they're in range especially with the 30 inch range of intercessors and deep strike i can delete two msu units a turn with each unit so that's i think the army i handle the best i think the two armies that i handle well are elite armies like custodies because i have a C of two plus poison and auto two damage weapons. Yes, it's a lot. Um, so it's armies like that, I think I handle well. Uh, the ar- the other army I handle well is uh, horde armies, just because I have so much poison. Like I don't care about how many so many there. shots. And most shielding horde units have either six plus saves or five plus saves, which means that minus one AP naturally on the on the intercessors and stuff is just like you don't get saves most of the time. Yeah. So that I mean they cut down orc boys like it's their job. And they can stop Orc Boys from charging, which is a little secret sauce Pretty that Death good. Watch have. Um, so I think those are the armies that I handle well. I handle well. I think the two armies that I have tools for but can struggle with is knights. Knights are always a slog unless you can kill like three knights a turn or two knights a turn. I have the capability to do that, but it's not likely. Mm-hmm. Um, really, I can kill like one key knight every turn, and then he just can't kill enough of me to then I will eventually win, but probably not score very high. Whereas, uh, you know, Castellan is, it's just always a problem. I mean, it's an elephant in a room, and I don't ever think there's any other army other than a Castellan soup army that handles Castellan soup armies very well. Yeah. And, I mean, like, Jay and I also haven't had tons of practice against that army, which is just, like, it's kind of scary. So I don't know how well I'll do against it. But that's essentially my army and how I think I will address those problems. So, Jay, let's talk about you. All right. All right. So, so we talked about Jay's yes, army. Yes. <laughs> now we're... <laughs> Man, that was fast. <laughs> uh, so I am bringing, uh, I'm calling it, as I uh, hinted earlier, my clown council, a revamp on an old classic, an old lady. Um, does but... it have enough clowns in it to still be called that? Yes, it does. <laughs> a very key clown is very key to my strategy. There's a, there was a, quite the quite the, uh, the trip that yeah. you went on. So we'll, we'll talk about two-thirds of the army, and then we'll talk about the last third and, and the little journey it went on to where it became now. So um, basically the first two-thirds of my army, one-third of it, uh, which is I've been testing for a very long time, you've heard me talk about quite a bit. We'll call this your core. My core. And this yeah. is absolutely the heart is... Uh, Half of the Clown Council is the Council, and that is my Warlock Skyrunner Conclave, or Warlock Conclave Skyrunner. It's one of those things, but it's 10 Warlock guys on bikes. Also um, referred to as a Seer Council. Also that I often refer to as the Seer Council, because um, they used to be called that's an that old term. 7th yeah. edition, but that's it's now a stratagem, um, which I use all the time. Um, but basically, it's 10 of these guys, and they each have four shir- twin shuriken catapult shots and a singing spear. And singing spears are also kind of the secret tech or sauce of this unit wounds anything in the game on because two. i mean 40 shots 
of a powered up unit is very strong typically but it's the fact that the singing spears are there's 10 of them and they wound anything in the game on twos they used to in old editions wound vehicles on sixes now it's just anything on twos yeah i think singing spears at one at one point you, their strength was like 3d6 i mean or it's something. still they're still strength nine they're still strength nine in in the which doesn't in matter? the book which doesn't matter it does not matter at all because in combat and when they shoot they're still only wounding everything on twos but they wound things on twos and they do d3 damage yeah which you can guess when you jinx something, a psychic power that minuses saves. Also known as the best AP in the game. Yeah. They basically can, they can delete knights. They can delete a bunch of stuff just with those singing spears coupled with the shuriken yeah. catapult. So they're the core of the army. I've seen what they can do and they can do a lot. So that battalion is, uh, and they also count as an HQ, which is really nice. Even though they're not characters, there's 10 of them. There's 10 of those guys with, and then a, a farseer on bike. And that actually, I'm using a detachment from Vigilist Defiant, that new book that came out uh, in December. Yeah, I believe it's called The Wind Rider Host. Yes, The Wind Rider Host. And it's really great for my army because yes. it helps me unlock a couple key things that I don't always use, but when I need it, nice to have. They are very nice to have in the moment. So, what Wind Rider Host gets me, if you don't know about the detachment, is it's one CP to, to, to add it to my army. And basically, my Farseer. And my Warlock Conclave Skyrunners have access to it. Because the only ones on bikes. There's only certain things I can get it. Yes. And it gives me access to if I want to spend an additional CP. Um, because my Warlord's actually in my Harlequin detachment. So if I want to give my Farseer the, another Warlord trait to give it the Field Commander ability. Yes. Um, I would spend an additional CP. Um, but if I do that, it actually lets him have this ability with the Warlock Conclave, my Seer Council, I'll, I'll call them for simplicity, um, it lets them leave combat and charge again. Yeah, I mean, that's that I feel is the most important ability in that detachment for you is because uh, they have flies, so normally the Seer Council can bounce out of combat and still shoot, but then to also basically give them a brand new turn of everything is super is strong. so good. And then the other thing they have access to is two stratagems, yes. which are both actually... They're both expensive, but I've used them in games, and they can be game-winning stratagems. Well, especially one within combination of a certain psychic power. Oh, yes. So one is Nimble Escape. It's 2 CP, and it lets me, after my Seer Council fights in close combat, immediately either if they kill everything, they can move and advance, or if the thing's still alive, they can just fall back. Yes. So, But their fallback is 16 inches, so it's pretty far. So it kind of makes them Yanari in a certain way, and it actually saves them quite a bit. Mm. Mm. But it's not, but it's not. Uh, but it, I have to spend CP on it. Uh, but it also makes them actually really good and defensive against things like, let's say, Blood Letter Bomb charges into them, or a Zangor Bomb charges into them, or something like Orcs that just has a million attacks, right? They can typically, the Seer Council is strong enough to weather a, a, a single round of combat, but where they really start to get hurt is where you do double fighting. Double fighting. And yeah. Blood Letters, Zangors, and Orcs can do it. So what, Tyranids. Tyranids. So even if something charges me, they'll swing once, I'll swing back, and then they're going to swing again at the end of the turn. I can pop this nimble escape and get them out of there before they can swing again. And guess what? Now I'm free out of combat, and I can now move, shoot, and charge freely in my next turn. Regardless of whether he's in range of that uh, character, that field commander or not. Exactly. Or the other thing I can do is charge into something, beat the crap out of it, and then fly out without taking any return damage. It gives me a lot of cool flexibility. So the, the last stratagem, which is really great, it's something that I wish... The unit had, period. It cost me three CP to do, so I only do it very rarely. But it means the entire Seer Council unit, as long as it's, I believe they've got to be close to the Farseer. Um, but basically, it lets all their shooting weapons have a minus one AP. All of their shooting weapons. So not just the Shuriken Catapults, which is strong enough. 40 shots, minus one AP no, is very it's, good. It's one thing. But it's the Singing Spears that if they're minus one AP, my goodness. The normally no AP singing spear is suddenly having a minus one AP, especially when we said you throw Couple it with like jinx. jinx. That's where you can get really nasty. That's where if they're attacking knights, which believe it or not, my army does very well against, if knights have a jinx on them, so their, their three up armor goes up to a four up armor, and then if you have singing spears, that brings it up to a 
five up basically yeah that means they're making five up saves against d3 damage that wounds them on twos yeah. and then the shuriken catapults on top like it is nasty yeah i mean five ups regardless remember because if this isn't the knight that has iron ion bulwark this the jinx affects invulnerable saves and regular saves which means that his inv his normal invulnerable save with jinx is now a six plus which means even with ion his armor is basically the same as his invul save so a five plus save on a knight getting hit with d3 damage weapons it's not good it's not it's very strong and uh and that's basically the the heart of the list and the, and the cool things i can do with it so now let's talk about the things supporting it so the seer council the far seer and three units of dire avengers they're five men guys um but let's talk about what's supporting those dire avengers which is in the next battalion which is a single far seer a single warlock both of these are on the ground with three Dire Avenger units, um, minimum units, just like the other three of five man where the Exarch has an additional Avenger Shuriken catapult, which is great. Yep. 18 inches, two shots apiece, assault, wonderful. Um, but they're carried along with three wave serpents. Yep. And both of these detachments, both of these battalions are Alatok, which is the minus what? one to hit. What? Use an Alatok. Yeah, what? Nobody ever uses that in Craft Worlds. You got to. It's amazing. There's arguments for Oathway. There's some arguments for Biltan. Uh, the Andin, if you're all ghosts. I mean, Yunari, Yunari, if you're taking Yunari, you probably got your spears are either Alatok or more likely going to be... Uh, it could be Sam Hain. Sam Hain that get the, the double advance. advance. Charge. But yeah. really, like, Core Eldar, you're going to see a Latok nine times out of ten because that minus one's so good, especially on a Seer Council to protect them. But um, basically what's uh, great is, I mean, Wave Serpents, to me, are an amazing cornerstone to any Craft World's army. They, they have a, a strong argument to be the best transport in the game. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, they went up in points with Chapter Approved, which I think is very fair. Yeah. They went to 120. I think they were 107 before, they so a 13 it. points increase. I'm all for it because they're still very good. Um, the Wave Serpents I'm taking, I'm taking them without Spirit Stones and the extra Shuriken Cannon only because I couldn't fit the points in because I went in other key places. I also didn't super need it. Yeah, the Spirit Stones help in some cases, but in a lot of ways, it's only stopping one or two wounds, especially with my rolls. So at the end of the day, it's 10 points per Spirit Stone, so it gave me 30 points back in the army, which how tight this army is right now, it was very needed. But to me, this core army of three Wave Serpents with two units of Dire Avengers in each, which leaves me enough room. If you don't know, Wave Serpents can fit up to 12. It leaves me room to put either a Farseer and Warlock in the same Wave Serpent together or in separate ones. It just lets me protect all my core characters in the game. Also, it gives, the I think, another key thing is that it reduces your drops significantly. Oh, my which gosh. Which means that very often you're going to have the plus one to go first. My drops... Or my, choose who goes first. Exactly. My minimum drops can be nine in yeah. this army which is amazing it's very low that's even low compared to when you think other like knight armies because knights typically have enough backup and characters that they actually well, I mean, are if, above that if they're taking loyal 32 or the rusty there that's an additional five automatically yeah. so i mean like even at, you'll go first against even most custodian or you'll choose who goes first even against most custodians armies because as well they will also have the loyal 32 with them mm-hmm so it's it it helps a lot and i from playing and i actually took something similar to this to lvo last year where i had three wave serpents with six dire avenger but units, no seer council but yeah. no seer council that had a different makeup but they are a great rock for capturing objectives people are surprised by how much damage that many uh, dire avengers can do and the wave serpents give me so many things not only protecting and reducing my drops and protecting characters they're great bullies they can go up and tag units i've tagged tau lines i've tagged broadsides to shut them down they almost die but 13 wounds with the serpent shield helps a lot serpent shield is one of the most annoying powerful things in the game not to mention offensively you can just spit mortal wounds out spit mortal wounds out they do so many things and against armies like orcs or demons that rely on dropping in and charging you they are great defensive points to prevent those armies from just turn one just like charging and killing oh. well not turn one but i guess Turn one for orcs because they can to jump, but turn two for demons of charging and just killing my whole oh, army. Look at that. They can fly, so they can just bounce out of they the combat. They can just bounce right out of combat. Isn't that dumb? And they got decent enough saves, and they're T7, so they're really hard to hit when you have no AP and you're just smacking them. So uh, that's the other kind of core of my army, and those are the two first battalions. Now, let's talk about the last battalion in my list. That's so funny. The, because the journey that my army has gone on. He basically left himself around, what, 250 to 300 250, points? 250, 300 kind of hovered around there. Low, low 200s, basically, of what can I do at the end of this? 
And it came down to, first I was like, well, because of these magic boxes, as we've indicated before, I need a way to deal with things hitting inside buildings. So first I was like, indirect fire. And they got a drop in points in chapter approved. And I was like, you know what? This is the one unit. I, I At this point, after years of collecting um, Eldar, or what is now known as Craft Worlds, I have pretty much almost every unit in the Codex without a couple Phoenix Lords but um, or Prince Uriel. Um, but I was looking at support weapons. And there are 37 points for one support weapon and the Shadow Weaver gun, which is a range 48, D6 shot, strength 6, on um, one damage, but on sixes, they're minus four AP. And I could get six of them, six of these guys, yep. to sit in my backfield, range 48, and they have indirect fire, and I can just shoot into the magic boxes. And I believe they're what? They're T5 and five wounds or something T5, like that. T5, five wounds, four up saves, so when cover the three ups, they're, they're hard to dislodge to deal with. And again, they can reduce my drops because they can be in, they can have a unit of three and a unit of three, and then when they drop, they separate. Yep. So they're annoying. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these. It's weird. It's wonky. It, it fits my very, you know, both Andrew and I try to take interesting, unique things for, yeah. for the fun of you listeners and as well for ourselves. You got to mix it up. So I was like, support weapons. Nobody will ever see this coming. I go to order the support weapons. They are out. And they are not going to arrive on time for LVO. So I'm panicking. I'm like, okay. Phase two of what I'm going to do. Uh, 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 everybody says they're very good. They're very good at shooting indirect. Uh, I'm going to take Dark Reapers. So I decided to take two units of Dark Reapers. Minimum units, because, again, I could only fit up to, like, 214 points, which I think is exactly two minimum units. Yeah, and um, it's essentially a, 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 the the X-Arch weapon, which is called a Tempest Launcher uh, and two escort bodies. Yeah, to basically, <laughs> the two escort bodies are there to take bullets from indirect fire, um, while the Tempest Launchers just hide in a building and shoot things indirectly. Now, Tempest Launchers are great. And they if they're are. supported by Yanari, they're also even better, along with regular Dark Reaper units. But what I found when I was testing that out is that just two Tempest launchers for that many points and not using the other Reapers that are in the squad, because it's it's not worth the CP to have three guys jump out, shoot two shots, maybe one of them hits, and then fire and fade back into a building. It's not really worth it. And then if they stay outside of the building, oh, they're they going to get shot and killed. Yeah. They're three T3 guys. You need to fire and fade them to protect them. So... It just wasn't working out. It wasn't putting out as much shots as I needed, and it just it felt like I wasn't using a unit to its fullest. It messes with you psychologically to the point where you're like, oh, I'm not. What's the point of this? So finally, I was like, What do I do here? I need to be able to deal things in magic boxes or just disrupt, like take out key things in an army and like kind of pinpoint something. So if it's not indirect fire, what is it? I was like, Okay, is there something in Eldar? in craft worlds that can go into these magic boxes and mess some things up. I was looking at Phoenix Lords. I was like, maybe Carandris. There was a point where I was looking at Howling Banshees. A real dark for a place. Minute, really dark place. Uh, that's not to say Howling Banshees are fine. If you use them, that's great. Um, I misread their rule, and I thought that when they come in, they can plus yep. three to their charge, which for a while I was like, oh my god, they have a six-inch charge when they deep strike. That's great for taking out backfield units. I misread the rule. It's only when they advance can they do that. So I landed on Harlequins. And it's full circle, full circle back to the classic for clown council, but no longer instead of using sky weavers, I took a minimum Vanguard detachment of a troop master and two death jesters. Yes, two death jesters and a solitaire. Now, before you went to say anything of, oh, he should take a spirit seer or the shadow seer. Uh, I the points were not the points. there. <laughs> Shadow Seers are like 120 points or 130, depending on what you give them. Um, and the True Master is like 70 if you go bare bones, or 74 in my case, because I had just enough points to give him a little power sword. Um, I wanted to give him a fusion gun or a fusion pistol. I wanted to give him a kiss or whatever, but the just points weren't there. So he's got a little power sword, but he's key because he actually gives my army, which I didn't have before, CP regen. Because he is your warlord. He is my warlord, and he has the Twilight Path. I think it's no, Twilight Pathway is his psychic power. He has the uh, whatever the Twilight ability that lets him, whenever my opponent spends a stratagem or I spend a stratagem, you roll a die. And it, this is one of the weird ones that actually lets you get more or potentially more than one CP back in a battle round. Yes. Because if I spend three CP on that Tempest of Blades stratagem I talked about, and I roll a three on my die, I actually get all three back. Yeah, I have to match the roll of the amount of CP spent on the ability, and then you'll get that much back. So it's very chancy, but when you get it and it's an expensive one... It feels good. I mean, even just doing a lightning fast reactions, which... Which is two. Is two CP, and then just making it free is like, that's oh, another lightning fast reactions. That's worth it. That, yeah. That's worth it just there to get two back. But that's what he's there for. But what it really unlocks is the death gestures, which are actually, they're 45 points, so they're uber cheap. They're characters, so you can't really shoot them unless you're close. They can shoot characters because they can actually snipe. They're decent enough shots, but what I really use them for is objective holding. 
they're sitting in the back. They're sitting on an objective. They're only 45 points. They can get out of danger pretty easily if something comes back there to kill them because they're Harlequins, so they can jump over terrain, and they're they have a four-up invul, their so characters. They targeted. So they're good to do that, but really the reason I took this was a solitaire. And while this is a mixed attachment because they're not all the same faction or chapter tactics mask. or whatever, or mask in the case of Harlequins, um, while the Death Jester and the Troop Master are Dreaming Shadow, so if I need to give them a special gun or if I need to have them shoot twice with their stratagems, the Solitaire is a Midnight Sorrow Solitaire. And yes, he doesn't get the six-inch consolidate or whatever it, the mask gives them. What it does give him is access to a stratagem, a stratagem that allows him to, when he dies... For two CP, fight again. Yeah, it's the trademark most factions have of a character gets to fight a second time, except uh, you also get plus one strength. And plus one attack. And plus one attack. And if you spend one more CP when he dies, called Torments of the Fiery Pit, if he takes any damage that round, which he did because he died, you can add two attacks and two strength. So now he goes from being a, for just, I believe it's three CP, because it's two for the fight again and the one for the Torments of the Fiery Pit. For three CP... He goes from, when he blitzes, from being 10 attacks to 13 attacks and being base strength 3 to strength 6. So when you add his kiss, he's strength 7. Or if you add his caress, he's strength 8 with 13 attacks. It's pretty good. And the solitaire for only 98 points, he is my key go into buildings and kill stuff. He does it very, very well. Yep. And now that, because of ITC, changed some things around, now that you don't have to pick what your free relic is at the beginning of a game, you can do it once you get to the table instead of having to put it on your list. He can now is my jack-of-all-trades tool against the army I'm fighting because if it's an army that has crazy Overwatch, like <clears throat> Tau, um, or even Orc Ludas, I give him the free relic Starmist Raiment, which lets him advance, and as long as he advances, which you're always advancing a solitaire, he doesn't shoot, uh, and he blitzes, um, he doesn't take Overwatch. So he can just touch broadsides and shut down entire units. He can touch Ludas and not only potentially shut them down, more than likely, though, kill, kill a bunch of them. Or kill most of like, them, Like, yeah. he is a great, great tool for 98 points, and now that I can make him fight again, usually the way he dies, because he's only five wounds, yes, he's a three of invul, but most of the things that kill T3, him... T3, T3, five he's wounds. He's T3, five wounds. Most of the things that kill him are things like orcs, or even a bunch of conscripts, or katachins, just a weight of attacks, just swinging back on him in close combat. Yep. And now he can attack again, which makes his points even more efficient. So that is my army. I really like it uh, for the things that I'm good against to kind of round this out. Very good against knights, actually. I think knights is your number one. I mean, I've played with this list three knights. I've played four knights. And the Seer Council just deletes you a knight. You give knights a, a bad time. And the problem and the thing that it does really well against, against knights is knights rely on doing high damage with not... A small amount of shots, but like medium level shots, let's say. And my Seer Council with all of its minuses to hit, because I can put Conceal on it, which is a minus one, which is a psychic power. It's a Latox, so if you're more than 12 inches away, it's minus one. And then Lightning Fast Reactions, it can get up to minus three very easily, yep. which punishes Knight Armies. <laughs> Stellan suddenly hitting on sixes. And just if like, you do oh. hit me, I have a three up invul. And then if you get through that, I have five up, what we call five up, feel no pain, but it's like a disgustingly with resilient. Your, with your powers on. With my powers on. Yeah. And with my bonuses and things like that, most knight armies don't have a lot of good deny. I can usually power up my seer council every turn, and I have redundancies in there in case I fail a few. It kills knights well, pretty fast. And you have the two, the two best psychic powers, one of which being the best AP in the game, because it's the only AP that affects invulnerable saves, and the other being a reroll all wounds. Like two of your psychic powers are literally like the best salve that you could have oh, to yeah. fight knights. Now, other armies, I think I'll, I'll probably do decently against. So your two. So that was your top. Then That's what my your, top. What are your two that you can? You have a, a very good chance. I think do? I'll do decently against MSU. Um, I, I think I'll do okay against MSU armies just because I have a lot of shooting and my Seer Council can go out and get some of their key units. Well, I think, I ironically think Inari doesn't have a good, most Inari armies don't have a good answer for this, for the council. Like, the Inari, well, the thing is that that's actually Reapers, tricky. Reapers, maybe? Reapers because they don't suffer my minuses, which is actually a big defense and the for auto my council. Three. And the auto three damage. So the Inari is a little bit tricky. Inari might actually give me some problems. The thing is that I have with Inari is a power that nobody ever uses in Eldar. It's called Will of Asurion, which I can give to one of my Farseers, and it gives him a plus one to deny. And I have so much deny in that army that me and the Yunari player will just be counterspelling each other. And if you cancel a couple key powers in Yunari, you can really shut that list down. Well, I mean, even just the one that gives them their shoot twice. Yeah. 
I can actually get into close combat with my Seer Council, and they're just as durable because their three of Invol stays with them. Meanwhile, the Shining Spears, if you get them in close combat, they have no Invol. They have no Invol, and you can really start cutting into them. So there's a couple of things. Yunari still might be a tough matchup, but I think that would be an interesting matchup. But I I think most MSU armies I'll I'll do decently against. I think I'll also do decently against hordes because I have so much anti-infantry with my Seer Council, with all of my Dire Avengers, with my way to kind of zone out demons with Wave Serpents, zone out orcs. Now, Ludas, if they get some good shots off, they can be they can be a challenge, but yeah. I have a couple plans to deal with the Luda Bomb because yeah. the Luda Bomb can kill like my Seer Council you in almost one shooting phase. You just you have to have a plan for Ludas because you can't let Ludas have an unmitigated turn. Yeah. Like they just... They, all they need is the one yeah. to just go crazy. Now, I have plans for, for dealing with Ludas. Ludas can't really take out Wave Serpents super efficiently. And if I deep strike the Seer Council in and deal with the Grots that way, there's a couple things. My Solitaire is also a key part of this plan. But I think I can deal with Horde relatively well. Now, where I think are going to be tricky, I think the Castellan list is always going to be tough. It's just, it's, just it's, it's got so many good tools that you can't just focus down one thing. Like, you want to kill all the infantry because they can bunch up and really punch you in the face you got to deal with the bulgrins because they're going to get in there and really mess you up and then the castellan i mean even though it doesn't do great against my seer council because again it's these single large devastating shots that my seer council kind of just you know doesn't really affect them they can it can really start taking out my wave serpents and really start cutting out the core of my objective grabbing in the game i mean the castellan list essentially has it's pulled from everything it has horde if it wants to it has msu if it wants to it has an elite unit in the bulgrins it has a knight unit so like it literally just pulls from every trough and it's just got it's so flexible and now the other the other army or armies that I'm worried about is actually elite. I think custodies, if they get good placement or if they go first or if I miss position and they can fully unload on my seer council, that many shots from all those bikes, because mostly custodies armies are just like 15 to 17, what are they, Valoris Praetor bikes, yeah. I think is what they're called. Just a billion shots, usually 60 shots per bike unit hitting on twos re-rolling ones strength four like that that many shots into my seer council and then charging in like with d3 damage weapons or I, auto two damage weapons. i have ways to maybe be able to prevent some things but custodians if they get good charges off and good placement they can really hurt my army the other one is tau tau are really really strong and they with all of their marker lights and things that they can get and their, their ability to hit flying things really well. My Seer Council, in a lot of cases, if I don't get key powers off, they can hit me on threes or even twos if I really miss on some powers because they get that plus one to hit with all their marker lights. And with all of their broadside shots, which are D3 damage, strength seven, and all of their riptide shots, which are two damage flat, like they can really punish the council. Yeah, I mean, I, I as I, we might have mentioned earlier, but essentially uh, Tau, it, like... Uh, Custodes is another avalanche army where essentially if it goes wrong, it goes wrong really quickly and it's hard to recover once they've dealt their blow with that army. So yeah, I mean, I I would agree that I think Custodes is a hard one for you because that really comes down to positioning. Yeah. So those are both of our lists we're taking to LVO. We're really excited. Hells yeah. Um, I, you know, We'll see what ends up. Watch, like, I'm going to lose my first game against, like, three knights. It's just going to be like, ah, I could totally take out that list. And just, I miss some key powers. Yeah, and then but I then just you get blow the submarine. Council away. You get the submarine from just the bottom. Submarine my way through. Now, I, I will say, let's let's call out what our goals are for LVO. Now, we, we always, Andrew and I, want to, obviously, if we can make the top eight, that would be incredible. That's very Highly diff- unlikely. Highly unlikely. Very <laughs> difficult to do. There are incredible players out there. And although we think we're, we're pretty decent players, we're definitely... There are some serious, serious contenders out there. I wouldn't call us top tier. Yeah, I would not. (laughs) Yeah, we're definitely not top tier, but I think my goal personally is to go, I did four and two last year. If I can, I really want to try to go five and one this year. I mean, I... I want to go 6 and 0 and I think that's it's still achievable for the two of us cuz I think we're gaining some steam with regards to the competitive scene. So just keep in mind that for the listeners out there there could there could be beyond far beyond the 8 in the top 8 that are still 6 and 0 and not in the top 8 yeah. because there's so many people that yeah, I mean I'd love to go 6 and 0. But then also not have the stress of being in the top eight. Yeah. But then it would also be kind of nice. It's exciting, but it's like, ah. oh my God, three days of many, many games. And also, here's the other thing, keep in mind, depending on how many people go undefeated, there might be a mini RTT that goes into the night the second day 
to decide who then goes into the top oh, eight. Oh no! So you might play even more than like nine games, and that's if you're going all the way to all the way to the that. top table. Yeah, I don't think my brain can handle. Oh that. my god! Yeah, it's too much. But for me, five and one. Are you you're calling out six and zero? Oh? I'm gonna say. I, I mean, like five and one. I think is a comfortable bet. We've we've two years I, I, in a row. You say comfortable. I still. It's gonna be very stressful just to get to five and one for me. Yeah, but um, I mean, like I I I you know I'm gonna get, express the confidence. We've gone two years in a row of going four and two. I think we have the capability to go five and. One. I like I like your confidence. I and I think the wish would be to go six and zero, but then to maybe not have to <laughs> be on camera and chess clocks and literally play our it's absolute str- best. It's stressful, very very stressful. But we we want to make it there, and if we do, holy crap, that'd be incredible. But five and one, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we hope to see you there. And speaking about that, we are going to be at LVO from from Thursday through Sunday. So if you're there playing in the tournament, we're going to be walking around in our World of Seas t-shirts. Or Wrath and Story t-shirts. Or Wrath and Story t-shirts. Who so, knows? Say hi. So hey, come by. Please say hello. We, we'd we love to meet you. We'd, lo- we'd love to hear how the tournament's going, how your, how your hobbying has been going. Uh, we love to talk to you guys every time we come to the LVO. So please come say hey. Um, and guys, that's going to do it for episode 55 of Roll to Seas. But before we go, one last little tidbit to announce. Um, as we make our way, because I think I might have found a, I think I might have found a corner here that I, it, it looks like it's a hole in in space. I think we can potentially get out of this closet. You go first. or or mystery wardrobe. You answers. go first. Oh, I'm gonna go first through this. Yeah, I see how it is. But if we can get out of here, there's a very real chance that in the next month we're going to be launching our new Patreon. Yes. which is this. Cool thing we've set up. We've already launched it for Wrath and Story, and there's a lot of exciting stuff we're doing there, but we've finally gotten together a couple exciting exclusive bonus things that we're going to release just for our, our Patreon backers. But uh, look forward to an announcement next month with that, and uh, it should be really, really cool. So check it out. Yes. And uh, as always, we'll be posting a new episode of this segment every last Wednesday of the month with episodes of Wrath and Story airing bi-weekly on Mondays. Again, Wrath and Story is no longer on the Roll to Seas feed. It's now on its very own exclusive feed called Wrath and Story. Yes. So check it out there. If you've been wondering where all those episodes went, it's over there. Um, and if you'd like to download more episodes or check out other similar podcasts like a very popular one, Friday Night Quest, our hilarious D&D podcast, head over to partialarc.com. Also, you can email us any questions at rolldeceased at gmail.com. We'd love to hear about your LVO lists. And you can always follow us on Twitter and Instagram for tournament and model picks when we remember to post them. And as always, thanks for listening, and see you guys next month. Goodbye.